This is the pre-lab lecture for microbes and food production. This lab involves chap uh, exercise 12, which is fungi, as well as a supplement uh, that you will be given. Both bacteria and fungi are used in food production. In this lab, we're going to be looking at both, starting with a look at fungi. They're common contributors to the processing of foods, and their use dates back to the start of civilization, when breads and wines were first made deliberately. These days, the selection and use of fungi and bacteria is a highly organized field of research and development in industry. Microbes impart both flavor and textures to foods. So, as far as flavors, terpenes, menthol, and lactones are produced by microbes to give foods their characteristic flavors. You know the tang of sauerkraut, and that is attributed to uh, fermentation by bacteria. Microbes also impart texture to foods. Cheese's texture, for example, is influenced by bacteria and fungi. The runny cheeses versus the hard cheeses have textures because of microbial products. We begin looking at kingdom fungi, or kingdom mycetae. This includes the molds, the mushrooms, and the yeasts. As you know, they are eukaryotic and heterotrophic. Some of them are pathogenic or parasitic, of course, you know this if you've ever suffered from athlete's foot or jock itch. They produce spores for reproduction. Their spores are different from bacterial spores. As you remember, bacterial spores are for survival. Bacteria, only a few genera, produce spores for uh, survival, and they only produce one spore inside of their cell. Fungi are very different. They produce many spores, and they are much more easily destroyed by antiseptics and disinfectants, and they very easily spread around the room. The classification of mycetae is based on the sexual spore type. Molds, mushrooms, yeast, can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Some of these groupings are unable to produce uh, asexually, and there's a group called the deuteromycetes, which a uh, sexual stage has not yet been found. Molds have a variety of anat anatomical parts, and the stylized mold that you see here isn't really one, but several different molds together. When we look at molds, we describe their growth above the surface as the aerial mycelium. Below the surface is the vegetative mycelium. The vegetative mycelium is going to consist of hyphae, and these hyphae can either be septate, having lines in them, or cell walls, or aseptate, having no walls. Above the surface, in the aerial mycelium, we're going to see fruiting bodies. Fruiting bodies give rise to the spores, and there are different spore types. For example, these spores that look like a string of pearls are called conidiospores. They are born from a structure called a conidiophore. These are sporangiospores. Sporangiospores are formed inside of a sac called a sporangium. Here we see macroconidia as opposed to microconidia. Sometimes you'll find both on a mold species. Later, we'll be looking at chlamydospores when we do the respiratory lab. Chlamydospores are produced by Candida albicans, a, a yeast that, that causes thrush. Also, we see here arthrospores. You know the prefix arthro refers to joint arthritis. And so you can see that these spores are formed from the breaking up of a septate hypha. Some of the categories of um, fungi begin with oomycetes. These are the water fungi. We don't use these in food production. Their asexual spore is known as a zoospore. Their sexual spore is an oospore. They have aseptate hyphae. And the example we have here is Phytophthora infestans. This causes potato blight and also tomato blight. Uh, there have been a number of years in western Pennsylvania where we've had a problem with tomato blight uh, towards August. These lovely tomatoes that are hanging on the vine turn black and drop off, and this is due to Phytophthora. Phytophthora also causes potato blight very easily spread by water. There were some wet years in uh, Ireland, and there was a great potato blight which brought many immigrants to the United States. If you're of Irish origin, you may be here because of the potato blight. The Kennedy family immigrated to the United States because of potato blight. The zygomycetes are the bread molds, but they aren't only growing on bread. Their sexual spore is called a zygospore, and their asexual spore is called a sporangiospore. They have aseptate hyphae, uh, 
examples here are rhizopus and mucor. We're going to get a chance to see rhizopus in the lab. One thing about rhizopus you can see is that it has these structures called rhizoids. Rhizoids are like roots. The ascomycetes are the sac fungi. They're asexual spores called a conidiospore, sometimes further classified as a phyllospore if it is in penicillium. Their sexual spore is an ascospore. They have septate hyphae, and some examples that we have here are Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces is a yeast that you're familiar with that is used in bread production. Aspergillus and Penicillium are two molds that you'll have a chance to see in lab, uh, and they are also Ascomycetes. The Basidiomycetes are the club fungi. You're familiar with them as the mushrooms. Their sexual spore is called a Basidiospore, and most of the time they don't have an asexual spore. Agaricus is the mushroom you're familiar with that you put on your pizza or in your salad. Ammonida, on the other hand, is a, the deadly mushroom. If you've gone outside in the summertime and it looked like a dog vomited on your mulch, you're seeing a slime mold. These are the myxomycetes. They're not a fungus, actually. They're protists, and uh, they are seen usually on dead and decaying material. They have a very complicated, as you can see here, life cycle. In the laboratory, you're going to be given a piece of cheese. This cheese is uh, Shropshire, or perhaps blue cheese, maybe Stilton. And you'll see that there are some veins in these cheeses. And from that, you are going to be cultivating these molds. Molds require specialized augers. These augers tend to have a lower pH because molds do like things a little bit more acidic. And then some additional nutrients are put in, such as tomato juice or cornmeal or even bird seed. We don't tea streak molds. Uh, their spores go everywhere. So instead, we just do a point inoculation, touching it to the auger. And from that, the fungal colony, or the phallus, is going to grow outward in a circle. We incubate typically both at room temperature and 37 degrees Celsius in the lab because fungi can be dimorphic. A dimorphic fun fungus will show a yeast morphology at body temperature, and it will show a mold or fuzzy morphology at room temperature. Incubation time typically is longer than for bacteria, so it may take a week for your molds to grow. The body of the mold, as I mentioned before, is called the phallus. Yeasts are a little bit different cultivating uh, than molds. They generally do well on all-purpose media that's designed for bacteria. We can use specialized media, and later this semester we'll use cornmeal auger when we grow Candida albicans in the respiratory lab. Candida albicans causes thrush. You can tea streak molds, and their colonies, as you can see here, look very much like bacterial colonies. They tend to a little bit look more glabrous or waxy, so you can differentiate them with experience from bacterial colonies. When we begin to identify a mold, we first just look at it. Macroscopic morphology includes observations of the top coloration and the reverse coloration if it's growing on an auger dish. Sometimes it'll be gray or gray-green on the top, but it will be black on the bottom. After looking at it and just describing its morphology, and in your lab manual you can see some of the terms that are used to describe morphology, we then look at it microscopically. We want to look at intact fruiting bodies and spores, just finding spores by themselves won't help us to identify the mold. So we also want to see the hyphae to see if they are septate or aseptate. The stain that we use in mycology is called lactophenol cotton blue, and it enhances detail with this blue color. Yeast we can gram stain, but it's important to keep in mind that yeasts, although they look gram positive, are not gram positive. The only thing that really can be graded with a gram-positive, gram-negative reaction are bacteria. They do stain a very dark purple color because they have cellulose in their cell walls. The cellulose is going to attract the iodine in the, the Gram's iodine step and is going to stain the yeast a purplish-black color. You see these blue-black blue -black budding cells here? These are blastospores, or the uh, reproductive structures of the yeast. In order to identify yeast in the laboratory, the gram stain isn't going to help us much. So we typically will use a carbohydrate fermentation panel uh, and also look at the enzymes that the yeast produce. One of the first things you'll be doing in lab today is a slide culture. 
the slide culture is going to allow you to cultivate some of that mold from the cheese that you've been given. The slide culture uh, begins by describing the color and the gross appearance of the mold in the cheese sample. And then you are going to inoculate a cube of this specialized auger called mycological auger inside a slide culture chamber. You're going to incubate this for a bit, about a week and then you can uh, take a look at this, not only the slide underneath but the copper slip in order to look at the microscopic detail and try to determine the identity of the mold. You'll also be doing a scotch tape preparation using a provided specimen of geotricum. Geotricum is used to inoculate the soft curds when making brie and camembert cheeses. So uh, geotricum produces a variety of enzymes that causes that brie cheese and camembert cheese to get really runny inside of that white rind. The white rind actually is coming from another mold called penicillium candidum. In order to do the scotch tape preparation, you're going to tear off a piece of, piece of clear scotch tape. You don't want any fingerprints on that. You'll loop the tape with the sticky side out and touch it to the surface of the mold growing on the petri dish. You'll put a drop of lactophenol cotton blue on the slide and then spread that tape over the top of lac the lactophenol cotton blue. Your tape is becoming a cover slip. Observing this at 400x, you're going to see the arthrospores of geotricum that you can see in the image. You're also going to be observing three uh, asexual spore types on a single slide. This prepared slide has three spots on it, a red one, an aqua one, and a purple spot. The red stain has rhizopus. You want to look at this at 100x, looking for those rhizoids, and also looking for the spore type. Rhizopus, as far as food is concerned, is used in tempeh production. And with a little luck, we'll have an opportunity to taste tempeh uh, so you can see what it is like. The aqua stain is aspergillus. You want to get a little higher magnification with this one. Uh, observe it with 400x magnification and note that aspergillus is used, used in the production of soy sauce. The purple stain is penicillium. Penicillium you'll want to also observe at 400x. And notice you don't have to use 1000x for molds. Molds are much larger than bacteria. Penicillium species commonly are inoculated into cheeses to produce the blue veins. So you'll probably uh, isolate, if you had Roquefort or Stilton, maybe even Shropshire, you may isolate a penicillium species in your slide culture. Other penicillium species are inoculated onto the surface of cheeses, such as Brie and Camembert, as I mentioned, to create the white rind. We're going to look at the lab manual to identify the spore type and to label the parts of the mold. You'll also be gram staining some yogurt prepared by Dr. P. Uh, in the yogurt, you will see two gram-positive organisms. You'll see streptococcus. You'll know it's streptococcus because you'll see the typical chain of cocci. And this is streptococcus thermophilus. You'll see a rod-shaped bacterium in there, which is lactobacillus bulgaricus. These two are required by U.S. law to be in yogurts. And then very often other probiotic cultures are added to yogurts. Dan and Activia, for example, have, has an organism it calls Bifidus regularis. That is a proprietary name. It's actually a bifidobacterium. Sometimes we find Lactobacillus casei or Lactobacillus acidophilus also added into yogurt. The red matrix that you see in the background is the protein uh, in the yogurt that is staining. You'll also see a demonstration of wine production. The yeast that is going to be used is a Saccharomyces species, and yeast will ferment grape juice to ethanol and carbon dioxide. The winemaker is going to use two tools in order to determine how much sugar is in the grape juice. How much sugar is going to dictate how much alcohol can be produced. There's a scale that is called the brick scale in winemaking, and beer making is called the balling scale. And we uh, gather a number from either the hydrometer or the refractometer Compare it to the bricks or balling scale to determine how much alcohol potentially will be in the end product. Both of these tools, the hydrometer and the refractometer, measure specific gravity. Specific gravity is just the amount of dissolved solids that is in a solution. There's a standard table in your lab manual, and it will predict the percentage of alcohol when you know the degrees bricks or the degrees balling. 
the definition of degrees bricks is one gram of sucrose in a hundred grams of solution and that represents the strength of a solution as percentage by mass in lab you're also going to be making a variety of foods one is old-fashioned ginger ale one group will do this this is a quickly fermented product. The alcohol content is actually very low because fermentation is quick. The yeast provides the natural carbon dioxide as opposed to ginger ale that you're familiar with in which carbon dioxide is bubbled in to give the effervescence. Another group will make kombucha. Kombucha is a fermented black or green tea. This uses a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast, sometimes referred to as a SCOBY, that gives an effervescent, slightly tangy product full of probiotics. You can see in this image the SCOBY in this tea. SCOBY's filtered out and it can be used. In fact, many people share SCOBY's, so we call the SCOBY a mother. Another group is going to make sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is a very complex microbial fermentation. Lactic acid bacteria, LABs, and other bacteria are also involved. In fact, it it's only involves microbes that are present naturally on the surface of the cabbage. You might be familiar with kimchi, a spicy sour fermentation that uses Napa cabbage, onions, and red peppers. And one group is going to be making kimchi, a very tasty, probiotic, full uh, product. Another group will be making vinegar. Vinegar is actually not a fermentation, and it's a, it is an aerobic oxidation of wine or cider to acetic acid. It uses acetobacter, which is in a matrix called a mother or mother of vinegar, which you can see at the bottom of this jar of vinegar. So the students who do this will be using um, a mother vinegar that I've kept going in my kitchen for a while. Another group will make a fermented milk product called kefir. Kefir is started from a culture of kefir grains. These grains are very much like a scoby or a mother. Uh, they're also a, a mixture of bacteria and yeast in a, uh, a cellulose, cellulose matrix. Uh, you can also start kefir from a dried culture. We'll be tasting some other foods, probably not in lab, but during lecture, if I can find them in the, uh, the local Whole Foods. We're going to try tempeh. Tempeh is soaked, partly cooked soybeans inoculated with rhizopus. The mold grows in there and the mycelium is going to knit the soy curd into a solid mass. So it's commonly used um, as a meat substitute. Another product is corn. Corn is a mixture of the mold Fusaria venenatum and egg albumin, or egg whites. Uh, this mold is allowed to multiply. It's added to the egg white, and then it's pressed into molds. You can buy this as patties. Uh, you can buy it breaded like chicken nuggets. Uh, and you can also get it crumbled. So sometimes they call it TVP or textured vegetable protein. This really isn't vegetable protein. This is fungal protein. Uh, and finally, we're going to hopefully have an opportunity to taste miso paste. Miso paste is a, a traditional Japanese seasoning. It is a process very much like making soybeans. Soybeans taken a little bit further. It's produced by for fermenting soybeans with salt and aspergillus oryzae. Uh, there are different types of miso paste. You might be familiar with miso soup that's made with miso paste. Uh, miso is full of probiotics, but once the heat is heated, the probiotics are killed. So if you're using it in miso soup, uh, you're no longer getting the benefits of the probiotics.